The following message is by Pastor John Piper. More information from Desiring God is available at www.desiringgod.org. Consider your leaders who spoke to you the Word of God. Consider the outcome of their faith and imitate their lives. This is biblical mandate for biography and I take it seriously. And I ask now that among the untold number of things that you plan to do here now in this hour and in this conference, you would grant us to love the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God and is our everlasting satisfaction more because of this. I pray that you would make these pastors more courageous because of this and less fearful and anxious in dealing with the truth. I pray that you will illumine our minds concerning the nature of truth and the way it should be expressed and defended in our day. I pray that we would know our times and render far seeing service to the church. And I pray that we would stand against the world for the sake of the world. Mingling properly. Do not be conformed to this age and become all things to all people. And I pray that someday none would be missing from this room when we gather to be and see and delight and display the glory of Christ forever and ever with ever increasing joy. Help me now to be faithful to the truth concerning Athanasius and concerning our day as your word comes to bear on both. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. A few comments about books, and then we launch. This is the Nicene and post-Nicene Fathers, uh, Athanasius, Selected Words. Everything he wrote that's available is in here. So put this in your library. If you don't have the multi-volume set, you can get the one on Athanasius. And I could mention individual works that are in here that are worth the whole volume, but maybe that later. And then this you can read in one sitting, and it's a good overview of his life. Very popular, uh, written by a nun, I believe. And I, that was my first thing. I just jumped in here first last summer and loved it. Just got the big overview of his life because I didn't know anything about Athanasius except Contramundum. And so, and then uh, the Holy Trinity, he didn't write this. This is the most recent big book on the Trinity that's been published Bruce has a little accessible one that you can get at. Your people will not read this one, but you might. And it's got a a big chapter on Arius and a big chapter on Athanasius. And I got help from Robert Letham, or however you pronounce it, the Holy Trinity in Scripture, History, Theology, and Worship. Athanasius was born A.D. 298 in Egypt and became the... Bishop of Alexandria, June 8, 328, at the age of 30. He was viewed by his people as the Bishop of Alexandria his whole life long until he died at the age of 75 in 373. And I say he was viewed that way because... He wasn't always there as bishop. He, he spent 17 years of his 45 years as bishop in exile because he was banished by imperial forces five times from his country or from his city, at least. And nevertheless, all of the alternate bishops that the forces installed were never viewed as rightful bishops by the people. He was deeply deeply loved by his people and they waited for him. Imagine yourself being forcefully evicted from your church for seven years and your people waiting eagerly until you came back and then welcoming you with palm branches after that seven-year 
exile. We don't know much. I think that's one of the reasons why there aren't more biographies. There aren't a lot of details about the life, just the controversies. In the whole of our minute knowledge of his life, this is Archibald Robertson who did the editing and wrote the biography at the front of this. In the whole minute knowledge of his life, there is a total lack of self-interest. The glory of God and the welfare of the church absorbed him fully at all times. The emperors recognized him as a political force of the first order, but on no occasion does he yield to the temptation of using the arm of the flesh. Almost unconscious of his own power, his humility is the more real for never being conspicuously paraded. Courage, self-sacrifice, steadiness of purpose, versatility, resourcefulness, width of ready sympathy were all harmonized by deep reverence and the discipline of a single-minded lover of Christ. And as we all know, the way that love, this single-minded love for Christ expressed itself was through a life of defending the deity of Christ over against the competing heresies. The war started in 319 with Arius, the deacon of Alexandria, writing a letter to Alexander, the bishop of Alexandria, in which he argued that if the son is truly a son, then like all sons, he must have had a beginning and there was a time when he was not. Now, Arius wrote almost nothing that's preserved. We have three letters and a fragment. And so everything we know about Arius, we learn through those who were against him. And they were many, and yet not as many as you might think. Athanasius was a little over 20 when that letter was written. Arius was 38 years older than the young Athanasius, which is a little lesson, I think, in itself that older doesn't mean wiser always. That's one of the points of the section on Elihu in the book of Job as well, by the way. He wrote the deposition by which Arius was put out of his job. And that was the role that Athanasius fulfilled the rest of his life. He was a writer in defense of orthodoxy for the next 45 plus years. 321, a synod was held in Alexandria and Arius was removed from his diaconate and declared to be a heretic by the bishops in the area of Alexandria and Egypt. Eusebius of Nicomedia, that's up in the uh, in Turkey, it's the same as Izmit, Turkey today, picked up the cause of Arius and was the head and center of the Arian cause for the next 40 years in the eastern part of the empire. By eastern, usually the Roman Empire is like the Gauls over towards Spain and then the center part where Italy is and then eastern means Turkey and Syria and around that direction. And uh, to my amazement in this study, I realized that uh, most of the bishops in the east during Athanasius' lifetime were Arian. This is not a marginal problem. This was a major, major empire-wide problem. Constantine, as you know, saw a sign of the cross in 312, was converted to Christ and uh, issued the Edict of Milan by which Christianity was made a legal religion and became very interested in ecclesiastical affairs because when the bishops aren't happy it doesn't make well for the kingdom. And he didn't like this dispute at all. And therefore, he called the Council of Nicaea. And that's also up in Turkey near Istanbul. He had an advisor named Hosius. And the Hosius said, do this. We need to get this 